All right, we're going to get started. Um, thank you to everyone who's here right now. Hello and welcome to the 2021 Taste of Science in Annapolis uh, Festival, which is virtual for the second row in a year. Um, if you're joining us from somewhere else in the world, welcome to Indianapolis. Um, for those of you who might be new to the festival, Taste of Science is um, a, an annual festival that's run by the nonprofit outreach group, um, uh, Organization Scientists. Inc., uh, which was formerly known as the Pint of Science US. Um, we are a passionate group of volunteers dedicated to bringing scientists out of the lab to explain their work um, in an easily accessible way to an interested audience, um, which is all of you joining us today. So Taste of Science is not uh, just happening in Indianapolis. Uh, this is actually a nationwide event. Um, it's happening in cities like New York City, Houston, Philadelphia, and Tampa. So there's actually more events happening all of this week and they're all virtual. So it's the perfect opportunity to engage in cool science across the country. Um, and you can share that with your family and friends as well. So if you'd like to learn more about the upcoming events, you can head to tasteofscience.org. Um, and there is a whole lineup of the events going on this year or this week. Um, and before we get started with the actual event we have for you guys today, in Indianapolis, it takes a Midwestern village to put together the Taste of Science Festival. So I'd like to thank a few people first. Um, we are proud to partner with local science outreach nonprofits, including Central Indiana Science Outreach, since, which is um, Cinso Indy, C-I-N-S-O Indy, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, if you're interested, um, as well as Indiana Sciences. They're handle is Indiana Sciences um, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, and both of these groups uh, and our group of volunteers have helped us put this event together. Um, there are also a lot of local science outreach events that are occurring regularly in Indy. Um, many of them are now virtual and they're live streamed, so it's the perfect way, uh, makes it very easy for anyone to join in. Um, and so there's actually a few events happening um, within this week that I like to just point out. Um, Sinso and Indiana Sciences, uh, they host a monthly book club called Books, Booze, and Brains. Um, and it used to be in uh, a, a bar or a brewery that they met, but it's now virtual and you can join in with your own beer of choice. Um, and there's actually one happening tomorrow evening. Um, the book that will be discussed is um, Superior, The Return of Race Science by Angela Saini. And Dr. Brownson Tucker Edmonds of uh, Indiana University School of Medicine is actually the expert guest who will discuss the book with um, the guests that are go going to be joining in. So um, it sounds like it's going to be a great one. Um, Indiana Science is also doing their City Nature Challenge uh, from April 30th to May 3rd. This is an international event um, that Indy is actually a part of. And it's a really fun challenge to do, uh, whether you have little kids or cousins or nieces or nephews or even friends that are interested in nature. It's really simple. All you have to do is um, you go anywhere in the city. Um, it can even be your own backyard. And you can look for any plants and bugs and animals, take some photos, upload it to their app or website. Um, and it's the underlying goal is to develop an understanding of your city's biodiversity. So it also keeps track of what's going on year to year. Um, so again, that is April 30th to May 3rd, which is this weekend. Um, and if you want more information on that, you can go to indianasciences.org. Um, so our collaborations with these local science outreach groups, as well as Taste of Science, allow us for the freedom an opportunity to highlight some very incredible scientists and scholars right here in Indy. And we're very excited to use this virtual platform to share some of the best Indianapolis has to offer you wherever you're joining in from. Uh, so last week, we actually had an event, a Taste of Science Indie event that was focused on the microscopic world of cells. So today we are going macroscopic with space. Uh, my first encounter with space as a concept was uh, the movie Alien. I shouldn't have been allowed to watch that, but I was. And surprisingly, that did not scare me away from getting very fascinated with space, um, as I think every single one of us are. Uh, and I really wanted to be an astronaut. And it turns out there's a lot of different components of space travel and space research um, that even allow astronauts to travel to space uh, and other planets and do their research there. 
And those components are studied by and improved upon by people like the three people you're going to be hearing from today. So our speakers today um, are um, going to be talking to you about bone fracture healing in space, neuroscience that could help us understand how the isolation of space travel affects astronauts, and a high performance biotechnology for microgravity research. That was a mouthful, um, but I'm going to let the speakers uh, talk all about their work and I'm sure it's going to be very, very exciting. Um, very quickly, our schedule for this event is going to be, the speakers will give a talk um, and we're then going to, after their talks, move on to a Q&A panel with all three of them. So feel free to ask questions in the Zoom chat or if you're streaming this from somewhere else, um, feel free to drop your questions into the chat. And we have our team monitoring the questions and the comments, and we'll make sure that those get asked also. Um, and finally, we also have a bingo, um, which is our front event for this, uh, this Taste of Science event. And uh, we're going to post a link to, it's going to be a unique link for everyone. So if you click on the link that's being put into the chat right now, this is for Zoom attendees and Facebook streamers, I guess, uh, or I believe. Um, and that will give you your own bingo card and follow along, listen to the talks. And if you get bingo, uh, just let us know in the chat and also put in your unique URL so we can just double check. And the whole point behind this is the first three people to get bingo, we have some very cool prizes to give out. Um, so we're going to follow up with you guys um, and make sure you get some cool um, local science outreach and maybe taste of science um, uh, stuff that we have to hand out. Um, and I think I've talked long enough now. So we're going to get started with our speakers. Um, first off, uh, starting us with our first talk today is Dr. Ushashi Dadwal, who is a scientist at Indiana University School of Medicine. Um, her research focuses on bone healing, which is very relevant to space research because it is reported that zero gravity can affect bone density in humans. So there's a lot to be studied um, and learned about bone healing in relation to space. And Dr. Dadwal is here to talk to us about that. Dr. Zadval, if you want to share your screen and you can take it away. All right, thank you so much. Um, here we go. All right, thank you for that introduction. I am Ushashi Dadval. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Melissa Cassina at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at uh, Indiana University School of Medicine. I'm thrilled to be here to talk about how a fracture healing in the bone is affected during space flight. Um, I'm just gonna, sorry, there we go. All right, uh, I'm just gonna hang out on the disclosures for maybe a couple of seconds and then go ahead with the slide. Hopefully everybody had a chance to read this. Okay, so um, why do we really care about space? Uh, this is a infographic from uh, the NASA website which talks about uh, NASA's future plans, which include, um, uh, which include international partnerships in the in the form of the International Space Station in the lower Earth orbit, as well as commercial platforms like uh, commercial platforms with companies you guys might have heard of, SpaceX and uh, Blue Origin. Uh, NASA also plans to send several missions to the moon again, as well as what we've been really hearing about in the last couple of weeks is. Um, the Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity flight, which has been fantastic uh, because now we know how the atmosphere is in Mars. Well, we know more about the atmosphere. And all of this is super important because um, NASA is trying to send um, crewed missions in the future. And these, are, these current missions are just information gathering sessions. And because human beings are going outside the Earth, we need to know what happens to these human beings. And there are several things that are affected uh, in astronauts that has all that has already known. Um, your your eyes get affected, your brain gets affected, your heart, uh, your muscles. You're more prone to coughs and colds. And the most important thing, I'm kind of biased, is your bones get affected because your entire skeletal muscle, skeletal mu system, which actually props you up, uh, doesn't have any gravity to help. Um, um, help it build and figure out what's happening. Um, just to give context, um, postmenopausal women that are 
that have lower bone mineral density, which causes osteoporotic fractures, lose about 1% of their bone mineral density in a year. In comparison, astronauts lose 1% to 3% of bone mineral density in a month. And they're right now um, ranging between three months to almost an, a year in space. So they're losing a lot of their bone mineral density. And why that's important is because of this little nice little infographic. So what we're looking at over here is um, trabecular bone, which is like the spongy part of your bone that takes a lot of the weight. Um, healthy bone looks like this or a really firm mattress. And um, porous bone or unhealthy bone looks like this where there are lots of holes in it. So it's like a lumpy mattress almost or people in the field like to call your bone looks like Swiss cheese. So there's a lot of holes and then it doesn't take the same amount of weight that it would. So um, all of this was really important. Uh, and uh, for that reason, Dr. Casina's lab in uh, collaboration with NASA, DOD and the US Army uh, were funded with um, um, two separate missions. The one that I'm gonna talk about, which happened in February of 2017 is the Rodent Research 4 mission. Um, and what we were looking at was um, sending mice. One of my colleagues actually calls them astronaut mice, which is not far from the truth. These mice um, underwent either a surgery in their femur, which is their femoral bone, uh, sorry, which is your thigh muscle, that's where your bone is, or they went underwent no surgery. And half of the mice that had surgery and half of the mice that had no surgery that served as a control group um, went up to the International Space Station. And the other half of the mice that had surgery and no surgery stayed on the ground. And what we were trying to look at is if astronauts are uh, spending a lot longer in space, they're not getting the same signals because there is lower amount of gravity. Does that, and because of that, uh, because they're adverse con conditions, if they have a fracture, will all these factors affect how, how their fracture heals? What we did was we took these mice and they were put into the, um, they were put into the rocket to launch in special devices known as transporters. These transporters can house about 20 mice, 10 on one side, 10 on the other. Um, the mice have enough space to move around, but they're also held securely while they are getting launched off Earth's orbit and going on to the International Space Station. Um, in terms of looking at um, the hardware that was used in the international uh, on the International Space Station, it switched from a transporter to a habitat, which holds 10 mice. So uh, five mice on one side, five mice on the other. Um, this was one of the first times that um, mice were co-housed together. Mice are actually uh, social animals. So they prefer being in groups. They get stressed out when they're by themselves. So this was an important, um, this was an important factor to consider for our studies. Um, this is what the inside of a habitat looks like. You have five mice in here, you have their food, you have their water supply. And um, I do not have a video of this, but the mice that were on the International Space Station were literally floating because of the lack of gravity and kind of crawling uh, over to eat their food. Um, so in terms of the actual timeline of these mice, uh, everything goes from the launch date either plus days or uh, subtracted days. So two weeks before the launch, um, the mice arrived uh, four days before the surgery was performed on uh, their femur. And uh, two days before the launch, they were loaded up into the transporter that I just mentioned and placed onto the, um, onto the rocket. Uh, it was the SpaceX 10 Dragon, I believe that took them up to the International Space Station. Uh, and then five days after they got there, because it takes such a long time to unload everything, they were moved from their transporter into their habitat. That is which where they resided over the time that they were on the International Space Station. Um, we specifically looked at bones because that's what I'm interested in. We looked at several different bones that are shown here. However, because of the because of the time constraints, I'm only going to talk about their humeri, which is their forelimb, so your arm essentially, and their um, hind limbs, 
where their tibia is located or where your calf is. Um, so we used a non-destructive technique to look at their bones. Um, it's basically just um, amped up um, X-ray imaging. So it's a three-dimensional structure of the bone um, that you can see using X-ray imaging via uh, micro CT. Um, and this is what the um, bone would actually look like. Um, so this is the spongy part of your bone. So this is on the top of your bone. And um, we're looking at the tibia. So the fracture was on the femur, but we're looking at the tibia because other bones, what we didn't know at that time, and now we know other bones are also affected if you just, if you have a fracture at one part of your bone. Um, and so all these graphs basically are just giving us bone parameters. And what the important takeaway from here is that the trabeculoc bone, that is a spongy bone that takes your weight bearing, um, actually had a decrease in its bone parameters in microgravity and if they had undergone a, uh, um, a surgery. So that's really cool to know. We know that bone mineral density decreases in microgravity, but if someone has a fracture, there's a possibility that their other bones will also be affected and they, their bone parameters will decrease. Um, we also looked at the mid shaft region of the bone, which is uh, tibia, so your calf, but like the middle of your calf where the bone is situated. And all these numbers again, just to show that um, the mice that underwent surgery had um, like a larger bone marrow, like a marrow area and a thinner cortical shell. So larger marrow area where all your cells are and then a thinner uh, outer bone shell. And the only way, <laughs> the easiest way I could think about is uh, rolled up wafers. I don't know what you guys call them over here. I think they're pirouettes. Anyway, they're basically just rolled up wafers, but if you imagine your bone having like a normal size rolled up wafer with like chocolate in it, as opposed to having a much bigger wafer, which is thinner and it, there's a lot more chocolate in it. So that means that there's a lot more like uh, cells in your marrow area. We do not know why that's happening because like I mentioned earlier, um, uh, people, uh, astronauts and other studies have shown with uh, mice and other animals, uh, uh, their immune system changes in microgravity. There are a lot of immune cells that are produced and present in your marrow. So we don't know whether it's because of changes in the immune system, the skeletal system, or maybe the way the blood vessels are forming as to why when you go, when you are in the presence of microgravity is um, affecting how your bone is behaving. Um, the second uh aspect that we looked at was the humeri, which is again your arm area, and uh, that showed that there were differences in uh, both space flight and um, surgery. So if you're in microgravity, if you have if you have a fracture, other parts of your bone are affected. Um, the one of the common factors of this were, um, like I mentioned, the immune system. And I also mentioned that the mice are social animals, so they get stressed out by them but when they're by themselves. This video is of, uh, so the top two rows are of mice that are housed in a single container. And this is from the Japanese um, space agency. They did some research as well. And the bottom two um, rows are mice that are in um, housed by themselves, but in uh, microgravity. And you can see they're floating around and um, they're hanging out in their little container. These mice, um, based on the data that was shown, are showed to have indicators of stress. And uh, our system, because it was housing five mice, they were in a social construct, um, we hypothesize or speculate that there might not be that much stress there. So something with the immune cells may be affecting how your bones are behaving, but we're still looking into that. So um, in conclusion, stress levels are reduced by co-housing mice, which is a good thing. Mice are social animals. And if you'd really extrapolate that, humans are social animals. So we need uh, them to um, co-house. Um, and then the other two aspects were the tibia and the humerus. Uh, if you have a fracture in the femur, not the tibia humeri, it, your other bones are still affected if you are in a microgravity environment. Um, I want to thank all the funding agencies that allowed us to do all the work that I showed. Um, I also would 
wanted to show pictures of people who actually contributed to the work because there was a lot of work. So this is the entire team that went down to the Kennedy Space Center in 2017. This is Expedition 50, the astronauts that actually housed the, housed the mice on the International Space Station, checked on them, did the, experiment, uh, did the experiments when they were on the International Space Station, which is really difficult because they're wearing all the PPE and trying to do really, really simple tasks. Uh, I have another image from Kennedy Space Center 2019 when we actually sent up, um, this was the Cell Science O2 mission where we sent up cells onto um, uh, another SpaceX launch system to the International Space Station. And this is one of the astronauts actually working on our cells at that point of time. Um, I know there are no questions right now, but uh, I would be happy to take your questions at the end. Thank you. I am going wow, to Dr. Talwal, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, I know, generally speaking, that bone uh, gets weaker in space, but I had no idea that it was this complicated and this intricate. So first of all, thank you for doing the research. Um, and thank you for this talk. Uh, I feel like someone needs to tell Elon Musk that it's going to be a lot harder to get people up in space. <laughs> um, so, okay, so uh, I think I got at least like 10 or 11 bingo spaces. So if you're following along, I saw quite a few things mentioned in Dr. Tadwell's talk. Um, again, thank you so much. And you talked a little bit about social behavior um, and I've done a little bit, but the next speaker is actually an expert in social behaviors and has studied um, the neuroscience behind it. So. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Jody Lucas, um, who is a neuroscientist and an assistant research professor at uh, of psychiatry at IU School of Medicine. Um, her research uh, focuses on understanding the biology of neuropsychiatric conditions, and her work uh, has included studying social isolation as well as the human response to stress and anxiety, both very important for something as isolating uh, space travel. So she is here today to talk a little bit more about her research. Well, thank you very much, Gio. I, um, I'm really excited to be asked to talk to you about this all, and I'm glad um, that uh, the previous speaker talked about uh, the how the effects of isolation can be really um, uh, stressful, and so that's what I'm going to kind of expand on. I'll, I've been studying the effects of social isolation on um, the neural mechanisms underlying anxiety and depression, and I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, so first of all, so uh, so we just heard about the effects that space can have on your bones, and now I'm going to talk about the psychological impact that space exploration can have on mental health. So it's been found that astronauts um, can suffer from extreme loneliness due to the social isolation of space exploration. And this has been associated with increased levels of clinical depression, um, suicidal thoughts, uh, increased hostility towards others, uh, as well as sleep disturbances, increased risk of dementia. And also what's been mentioned previously, um, it should have been shown to alter function of your cardiovascular systems, your endocrine systems, and your immune systems. And for this talk, I'm going to be focusing on depression, like how we study depression and um, the endocrine system using animal research that will, like I use a rodent model, and that helps us understand the effects of loneliness and isolation on the brain. And so um, recent articles have shown that astronauts really do um, face hardships and increased depression due to the isolation of being in space. And this really affects their health and well being. Also, um, in general, major depression is one of the most common uh, mental disorders and is the leading cause of disability worldwide. So therefore, it's, uh, there's a great need for us to understand the mechanisms underlying this disorder. Um, we also know that uh, it's been shown to emerge during adolescence and that it's more prevalent in females, specifically about 70% more females uh, suffer from depression compared to males. And this could be due to the fact that females um, have been shown to be more sensitive to stress. And um, so here we have uh, the percentage of patients with major depression who also suffer from some type of current anxiety, current 
anxiety disorder um, and listed are four anxiety disorders that are very prevalent amongst depressed patients. And then over here on the far right, we have the total number of depressed patients who suffer from some type of anxiety disorder. So 51% suggesting there's a high comorbidity between anxiety and depression. Um, however, again, the mechanisms underlying these conditions are very poorly understood in humans, so therefore we use rodent studies uh, to better understand these underlying mechanisms. And so for my studies, I really focus on um, the effects of stress during adolescence um, because early life stress is associated with long term alterations in both uh, neural systems and behavior that underlie symptoms of stress related neuropsychiatric disorders such as anxiety and depression found in humans. Um, suggesting that it's an important important development by environmental manipulation to study these um, disorders anxiety and depression. Um, also, social isolation is considered a model of adverse experiences because social interactions peak during adolescence and depriving them of these interactions can cause long term negative outcomes. And so in um, our studies, we use social isolation as a reproducible and robust adverse adolescent experience that's likely to be important in humans. And um, we know that there's many different kinds of stressors, but it's clear from the effects that we've seen on um, astronauts in space, as well as due to our current um, pandemic um, with the mitigated you know, necessity of being socially isolated from our peers, that um, isolation is a huge stressor for people. And um, this has been associated um, with increased deaths of despair, like increased suicides, increased uh, drug overdoses, as well as alcohol misuse. So it's really important for us to, again, understand the effects of this isolation on the brain. And so social isolation of rats has its most potent effects during a critical phase from early adolescence, so right around postnatal day 21, to early adulthood. And so the model of adolescent stress we use is the social isolation of rats during the sensitive period of development. This consists of isolating animals from a postnatal day to 21, so right around early adolescence, for a three week period to mid adolescence. Um, and so we isolate animals during this specific um, time period due to the developmental programming that's occurring. Um, for instance, from postnatal day 30 to postnatal day 40, you're getting um, monominergic activity and social behavior that are progressively increasing, as well as the developmental organization of brain regions involved oops, in motivation, um, decision making, and stress sensitive for brain regions. Uh, so therefore, alterations to neural development due to adolescent social isolation may increase sensitivity to stressors later in life, um, resulting in heightened risk of developing these mood disorders. And so after the social isolation, animals are then re-socialized, and this consists of pairing isolation-reared animals with other um, isolation-reared animals in a cages of three per group, and then our group reared controls also receive a new cage mate just to kind of help control for the stress of receiving a new cage mate. And so um, we use this resocialization period not only to help um, ensure that the animals grow into adulthood, but also to help ensure um, that the effects we see on brain development and um, behavior are due to stress during the specific period of development and not at any other um, point um, or during early life. And then once they've um, reached early adulthood, so around postnatal day 70 is when we do our uh, begin like behavioral testing and um, collect brain tissue, et cetera, to do analyses. So um, the first question we looked at was, does social isolation during adolescence alter anxiety and depressive like behavior in adulthood? And to um, examine the effects of anxiety, we used two very um, commonly accepted tests of anxiety, the elevated plus maze and the social interaction test. So the elevated plus maze consists of two closed arms, which are considered safe and two open arms that are considered unsafe or um, anxiety provoke anxiogenic. And so if you see decreased time spent in the open arms, this is indicative of increased anxiety like behavior. 
So here we have the total duration of time spent in the open arms in males and females. And in the solid bars, we have the group reared animals. And in the checkered bars, we have isolation reared animals. And as you can see, both male and female isolation reared males exhibit um, decreased time spent in the open arms, suggesting increased anxiety-like behavior. Um, also in the social interaction test, so this consists of placing um, the, the experimental rat with a novel size match, age match, sex match, um, con specific, and then they're allowed to interact um, for 10 minutes and it, behavior, social interaction is scored. This consists of following, chasing, crawling over and, or under the other animal, sniffing the other animal. Um, and so what we see is the total duration of social contact in this duration of social contact. Um, again, males show decreased social contact as well as um, females, female isolation reared animals, suggesting again and confirming that isolation reared animals um, exhibit increased anxiety like behavior. So we also looked at depressive like behavior and we studied this using the four swim tests. So this consisted of placing a rat in a cylinder of water on day one and allowing them to swim around and get acclimated to being placed in the water for 15 minutes. And then on day two, um, they're placed back in the water um, and their behavior is scored for five minutes um, to look at immobility, climbing and swimming. And so again, we have um, uh, males and female data and you can see that both males and females, the isolation reared animals exhibit increased immobility um, decreased climbing behavior as well as decreased swimming behavior. And these are all very indicative of increased depressive like behavior. So we do see very clear effects of adolescent social isolation um, on behavior. However, we aren't um, seeing sex differences in these measures and we're still working on finding a better or more refined model that would show greater female depression that, and stress sensitivity that we see in the human population. Um, so then we wanted to know what are the cellular circuit mechanisms that allow adolescent social isolation to increase anxiety and depressive like phenotypes. And so one mechanism through which adolescent social stress may alter vulnerability to stress related disorders is through the long term changes in the interaction um, between the stress um, related neuropeptide corticotropin releasing factor and serotonin. And so um, you're probably familiar that serotonergic systems are thought to play a major role in the etiology and pathophysiology of depression. Um, serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors are commonly used to treat depression. So we know that serotonin is really important for regulating stress. And so here we have an illustration of a rat brain on a sagittal plane um, showing where the dorsal raphae is located. This is where serotonergic cell bodies are located. And this region is made up of very topographically distinct organized um, functional subsets of serotonergic neurons. And there's multiple subregions across the rostral caudal extent of this nuclei. Um, and all of these subregions have very specific projections and react to stressful stimuli in different uh, ways. So the subregion that um, I specifically focus on is the dorsal part of this dorsal raphe. Uh, because it's important for stress and anxiety. Um, it projects to stress and anxiety related regions such as the medial prefrontal cortex, the nucleus accumbens and the basolateral amygdala. And it's also been shown to be activated by um, several anxiogenic drugs as well as stimuli. And then we are also very interested in how corticotropin releasing factor impacts the dorsal raphe serotonin. And so, Corticotropin releasing factor is a neuropeptide uh, that plays a role in the neuroendocrine, neurochemical, and behavioral responses to stress. And the dorsal raphe receives CRF projections from the central nucleus of the amygdala and the bed nucleus of the striatar stria terminalis. This is where CRF cell bodies are located. And these projections dose dependently modulate serotonergic activity um, within the dorsal raphe via two sets. CRF receptor subtypes. These are the CRF1 receptors and CRF2 receptors. Um, CRF1 receptors um, uh, are initiated 
in response to stress. Um, they are higher fit. They have a higher affinity for CRF, and um, in general, they've been shown to inhibit serotonergic neurons within the dorsal raphe, whereas CRF2 receptors require higher levels of CRF to be activated. And in general, um, CRF2 receptors are or have been shown to activate serotonergic neuronal activity within the dorsal raphe and um, are associated with increased fear and anxiety. So what we wanted to find is, are there changes in CRF signaling in the dorsal raphe following our adolescent social isolation paradigm? So we used uh, real-time PCR uh, to look at CRF1 and CRF2 receptor mRNA expression within the dorsal part of the dorsal raphe, within group and isolation root animals. And what we found is that isolation root animals exhibit increased CRF1 receptors and decreased CRF2 receptors, which we were pretty um, excited about because uh, literature has shown that if you overexpress CRF in the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, you get uh, CRF2 receptor decreases um, that lead to increased anxiety. So this kind of helped match that literature. And then we also have found um, that CRF blockers, such as um, a general CRF receptor antagonist, DFCRF, um, it dose dependently recovers the amount of social contact. So if you see in vehicle treated animals, again, we see decreased, uh, this is vehicle treated animals within the dorsal raphe. So um, you see a decreased social contact, but as the ink, as you see in at the higher dose of the CRF receptor antagonist, you actually see this reversal where there's increased social contact. So there's uh, functional evidence that CRF receptors in the RAFE are driving this greater anxiety. And so this leads to um, our overall illustration of our proposed neural circuitry that this social isolation has on um, how it affects neural circuitry to increase anxiety and depression. So we think that social isolation is leading to increases in CRF within the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, which then leads to these increases in CRF1 and decreases in CRF2 receptors within the dorsal raphe and, um, and these receptors located in serotonergic neurons. And this modulation leads to increased anxiety and depression in output areas such as the um, PFC, um, nucleus commons, BLA, uh, will like modulate those regions to lead to increased anxiety and depression. And so um, right now we're working on doing um, optogenetics to kind of functionally modulate this pathway um, to show if like our hypothesis on the circuitry is correct. And so far our preliminary data are really um, exciting to confirm that. And so um, with that, I'd just like to acknowledge all of the people um, at the various uh, schools that I've been at that have helped me um, do this research throughout the years and are currently helping um, and uh, my funding sources from NIMH um, NARSED, and then recent funding from CTSI and NINDS. And with that, I guess I'm not going to answer questions now, but I look forward to your questions uh, later. Okay, Dr. Lucas, thank you so much. Uh, I am biased because I've worked with Dr. Lucas before, but this stuff is really fascinating. And I've also always thought about this whole past year with COVID you know, uh, social isolation is not the same as being in space and being inside of a spaceship, but a lot of people, I think in large numbers have experienced it. And I've had, uh, you know, I've had, uh, I've talked to friends who've said that they're really being affected. So hopefully the research that you showed, um, is something that will help in the future, especially with cases like this, where it's not just, you know, it's, it's like a global social isolation. So, hopefully we can figure out any adverse effects and treat that. <laughs> so, yeah. So thank you so much. Um, uh, so I am going to remind everyone again, that if you do get bingo, which I think I had a few more spots that from Dr. Lucas's talk, and if you have bingo, feel free to just shout it out in any of the chats, um, or Facebook or zoom chat and send us your URL. Um, 
And with that, I'm going to move on to our final speaker today, which is Rich Bowling. He is the vice president at TechShot Inc., uh, which is a company located in Greenville, Indiana. And he leads the company's development of uh, very cool technology uh, that is designed to do scientific research in space. Uh, I'm really, really interested to hear this talk. So today, Rich is going to give us um, an interesting look into high performance payloads used in microgravity research. Um, so please help me welcome Rich. Oh, you're muted? I think I'm muted. Am I muted? Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, you're great. Okay. Yeah. So we are um, a small company of 50 people. Uh, we are an Indiana company. We're down on the southern border uh, near Louisville, Kentucky, but we're in Floyd County, the second smallest county in Indiana. And, uh, and, uh, but we have lots of terrific mechanical, electrical, software engineers and scientists to help build these tools, build these uh, devices that uh, help get science in space, like what you've heard discussed this evening. So let me see if I can advance this. Yep. So the, the major focus areas for us, enabling biological and physical and physical science research aboard the International Space Station. Sometimes the research happens on board the cargo spaceship on the way to the station. Um, and we anticipate being able to uh, start doing some research for our customers on board the lunar gateway, and even on the lunar surface. Uh, and then in space manufacturing is increasingly important to, to NASA, to the whole industry, and, and to TechShot as well. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then we've just started to get some uh, traction in a new area for us, which is um, enabling deep space exploration by working on some of the new designs for uh, spacesuits that will be worn on the moon. I, I like to say we, we build the picks and shovels that researchers use to do research with material science. You'll see bone densitometry there. Uh, and uh, so rodent research, uh, we'll even do some squid re research this coming year and lots of, and lots of other areas that are enabled by our devices and our research team. So th these uh, are all tech shot devices. So we call them payloads that uh, and these images are of astronauts on board the International Space Station with our devices. The International Space Station is an amazing destination for human space flight. It's uh, been continually staffed by uh, astronauts, continually staffed by even American astronauts nonstop for more than 20 years. There's not been a day when there hasn't been an American living in space over the last uh, 20 years. And so we're really excited to have been a part of that. Um, th so to speak specifically about what, what are these things, you see they're, they're sort of in these form factors about the size of a microwave oven. Uh, sometimes they're in double, double size, triple size, uh, or larger. And uh, so we have this x-ray machine for mice on board the station right now. And we've done bone scans and uh, scans of uh, muscle mass for even companies like Eli Lilly from Indy, Novartis, UCLA, any, many others. I think we've done 156 scans so far. Um, we can calculate the total mass of the animal, when you, know, you think about how do you weigh something in space? Did the animal lose weight, quote unquote? So it's really the question, did they lose mass? And we can calculate that with this and calculate the bone mass, the percentage of fat, percentage of lean tissue and send that right back down uh, to the ground to the, uh, to the researchers in real time. Here in our office, we have what we call the Payload Operations Control Center, which uh, enables us to talk directly to the astronauts one-to-one. -one. We, don't, we don't have to go through uh, NASA, we talk directly to the crew, their own staff, and we have, uh, they have cameras on board where we watch what's happening in real time with all of our equipment uh, to provide additional assistance if needed. Um, sometimes, as, as in the case of the bone scans with Lily, Lily scientists sat here with us in our office and were able to see what was happening in real time with their, their animals, which was great. Uh, another device we call the Advanced Space Experiment Processor. It's just sort of a generic box silver part you leave on board the space station and then the blue cassettes or the black cassettes we take back and forth on the cargo ships. The astronauts just plug them in and then we take over from the ground. We do everything from protein crystal growth in these tissue, tissue uh, research, cell culturing, um, and, and yes that's what we're going to be flying squid in 
coming up. It'll be our first example of uh, doing an experiment on board the SpaceX Cargo Dragon, which is an uncrewed automated cargo ship that goes to the International Space Station. And once uh, the sensors on board tell the capsule that it's reached microgravity, then um, we'll start this experiment for our customer, which is the University of Florida. Uh, so it, with, with only a couple of exceptions, the science is not tech shot science, it's our customer science. And we provide the, the access to space with all of our agreements, we provide the equipment, um, verification testing. So we'll provide equipment to the researcher to put in uh, her or his lab for months in advance before the, the rocket flight to really make sure everything works well. Uh, and we own all this equipment, we've developed it ourselves. Another uh, couple of interesting devices, the multi-use variable gravity platform or MVP. Again, these, these boxes, these blue boxes, uh, two of them are aboard the space station now. It's a generic processor and they, we launched to the space station, um, the smaller modules that you see on the two carousels. And um, those get inserted by the crew. We have got a bunch of different types of those. Um, so from everything from solidifying cement and fractional gravity, I mean, there's no chamber on earth to do zero G. There's no chamber on earth where you can do fractional gravity that you can reproduce the gravity of the moon or Mars in a sustained way. So how do you do that? You go to zero G and then spin a carousel at a certain speed where we can reproduce the gravity of Mars, or the moon or anywhere up from zero to two Gs. Um, we know zero G is, as you've heard described, harmful on bones, on muscles, depending on, on eyes, it's also, Harmful. How much is enough when we live for a long time on Mars or on the surface of the moon and be healthy? Um, so cu our customers are using our devices to do Drosophila research, to do um, bone chip research, bacteria, uh, plants, and, uh, and doing those tests at, at moon gravity, let's say. Uh, with the cement, it was interesting. We know that um, we know what the recipe of cement to aggregate is on Earth or construction, but we don't know if that recipe might change when you take cement up and mix it with a lunar, we don't call it lunar soil, but lunar regolith, moon dust, to try to uh, fabricate habitats. And so we did that for a customer. Um, so again, this is still part of in-space research. This is one thing that we, um, we do ourselves for our own research, but we're also opening it up for commercial customers who may want to use it. And these commercial customers could be uh, research institutions, universities, commercial companies, NASA itself, the DOD itself. Uh, in this case, it's literally a 3D bioprinter. And the astronaut takes the black cassette that you see on the right and inserts it into our bioprinter. And then in this case, Jessica Meir inserted bio inks into our, our bioprinter. And then we print thick tissue. Um, and then she takes the cassette back out and puts it inside one of those ad set units that you saw. And it lives, it really only takes moments to hours to, to, to 3D print in the bioprinter, but it takes weeks and weeks to condition that, those assemblages of cells into tissue. So you don't print tissue, you print cells, and then you condition into tissue. So our bioreactor there provides electrical, mechanical, and chemical, um, Simulations to the to the printing construct, just like you go to the gym and you want your muscles to get stronger and bigger, your body does all those same things, and the system does that also automatically. So we printed some multi-layer uh, cardiac constructs so far, and some uh, knee menisci, and that's what we're printing again coming up um, next summer for our customer. And then we developed in uh, conjunction with Tupperware this black and white. Uh, chambers here, these sort of plant pots, if you will. And it passively provides all the right nutrients and water at just the right rate to growing plants in space. Um, and so we've been testing that out in space as well. And then we, did, we didn't build this. All the other previous things that you've seen, we designed and built ourselves here uh, in our headquarters. But the uh, most complex greenhouse on board the International Space Station is called the Advanced Plant Habitat. Uh, and we manage that for NASA. We manage the science going on board in there. So you're, what you're seeing here is a uh, uh, great bumper crop of radishes growing inside the advanced plant habitat. And uh, astronaut Kate Rubin's about to take some samples of those leaves. And 
And what you can see above that is our bone densitometer. That's the um, you know, patches and stickers are important in this industry. Uh, it's like currency when you go to a conference trading uh, your stickers and patches. And so that's the, uh, that's the patch for our bone densitometer uh, that you can see uh, right there above that. We also manage science going on in on board the material science research furnaces on board the International Space Station. And then just on the in-space manufacturing bit, yes, uh, so the bioprinter, which we call the BFF, the biofabrication facility, um, for in-space production, we, we eventually hope to get out of a research mode and into literally a production mode for human organs and tissues. But this could be a decade and a half away and just the, the FDA approval process is gonna be like the you know, thorough as it should be. Um, but then in, in space production for, and, and by the way, those are for, for use on earth, off earth for the earth, those tissues. Uh, we can make it out of your own tissue and bring it back and you won't have to take any anti-rejection drugs. That's the plan. Uh, deep space food, so cultured meat is becoming quite um, an interesting idea recently. Uh, I know there's a restaurant in Singapore where you can order uh, cultured meat off the menu. So it's um, cloned and um, manufactured meat from, from animals that I believe are very much still alive. Um, and, uh, and so uh, it seems to have some promise for uh, not only sustaining astronauts in space and long-term space missions, but um, this process happening on Earth could, could be great as well. Uh, in space manufacturing, something we call the Pharmaceutical In Space Laboratory or PIL. Again, patches, stickers, and acronyms are really important. So the PIL, uh, it's a payload we're developing with a lot of great consultation from uh, the drug company Merck in uh, helping them develop a better crystalline form of drugs uh, like their drug Keytruda to improve uh, drug delivery methods, um, efficacy, so forth. So that's pill is in, is in development, has not flown yet. Uh, to go along with our bow printer, we're making something called what we call a cell factory where we'll be able to take um, human skin cells, blood cells into space, um, drive them backward into an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then forward again into the various types of cells that we need on board to, uh, to our bioprinting. One of the constraints for doing research in space is often uh, the amount of available equipment for, for the conditioned stowage. So how do you get your samples to space and on board the station and back, whether it's at ambient temperature, whether that's at 37C or whether that may be at minus 80 or minus 100. Um, and so that's, that's quite a constraint. And if we can um, rely less on that and be able to make more of what we need on board the station uh, long-term, then that lets us be far more self-sufficient. Um, lastly, in the in-space manufacturing, we're making something called the Fab Lab, which is a, a multi-material 3D printer that can do um, Titanium is the big one that, that NASA has asked us to develop uh, in space, a way to manufacture titanium parts. Uh, this one is more for exploration, less for use on Earth. Uh, titanium and electronics. Now it can also do all sorts of other materials, but those are the big ones that NASA wants us to work on. Uh, this is in our office here. It's a um, functioning prototype and a mock-up of a space station rack. Um, so that's a big new important one for us that will be eventually destined to go to after being tried out on the International Space Station. It will go to the, uh, the lunar orbital gateway and then to the surface of, of the moon eventually. Um, and then we just have a new contract where we're starting to work on, uh, as I mentioned, the um, parts of the lunar spacesuit. It's called the soft goods. So that's the, the, uh, the outer layer that you see most visibly on the, on the spacesuit. And then also the gloves. I think we're gonna start working on the gloves before, before anything. How do, we, how do we do all this stuff? And this is the last slide. Um, lots of agreements with NASA. So we've been around a little more than 30 years. We did work on board the space shuttle before, uh, before the International Space Station. So we have something with NASA called a uh, non-reimbursable space act agreement, which uh, is great. It, it essentially, this is among the contracts that essentially lets us run a business on board the International Space Station. Um, I think there are probably, 20 privately owned research and manufacturing payloads uh, available on board the International Space Station. And I think if you added all of ours up, um, I think we may have the most inside of the space station. There's a, there are a lot of them outside the space station as well. 
Um, I think we certainly have the most diverse catalog. Um, most of the research that you hear about taking place on board the station, um, with a few exceptions, is happening in some commercial companies' equipment. Um, while TechShot has some uh, designs for uh, rodent equipment, um, all the research on station now is with mice, and we've, we've got some designs and equipment that can also enable uh, research with rats. Uh, the current rodent equipment is NASA owned, but operated by a commercial company. So the Space Act Agreement gives us access to the launch. It gives us access to the crew. Um, uh, NASA wants to foster this sort of development work. If, if there's a science reason for us to do this work for a customer, um, that's pro pro provided at no charge to us and no charge to the customer. If it's for purely marketing purposes, NASA charges, I think, $130,000 per hour for the astronaut time and something like maybe $70,000 a kilogram to take something to the station and back. Um, but most of, the, most of the work going on on board the station is uh, of a research nature. And the IDEIQ contract, so the indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract with NASA, that's essentially a pre-negotiated menu of all of our equipment, all our services, um, everything that we do for a customer. Uh, and then contracting is just really fast and easy. Um, the total, Potential values so far, I think it's 49.9 million. Uh, we've got a few years left on that. We uh, sign another agreement. The Remus contract, that's the Research Engineering and Mission Integration Services contract. That's how we operate, manage the, uh, the research furnaces on board the station and the advanced plant habitat. Uh, and then the, the user umbrella agreement. So, so the ISS was, de was designated a US National Laboratory in 2005, and then NASA hired uh, a nonprofit called the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space in 2011 to manage uh, research from outside groups uh, on board the station. So research sponsored by NIH or NSF, um, research sponsored by, by commercial companies, um, and essentially research by people that aren't NASA on board the space station. And so we have a, an agreement with the U.S. ISS US National Laboratory, again, to provide these sorts of services. And um, we serve as what they call a, an implementation partner. Um, so we'd, we'd love to provide these tools, provide these services, help you get on board the station, um, help you understand the process. Um, this is, this is the, what I live every day. Uh, I'm not a, an engineer or a scientist, but on the, on the business side of things and really helping people get on board the station. Um, so if anybody has any questions about that or wants to know a little bit more, about uh, pathways to space and uh, how to come through the uh, tech shot front door to the International Space Station. Uh, I'm eager to answer any questions about that. So really, really um, grateful to be included tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rich. Um, that was an amazing talk. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I've got to say, I was very interested in the bioprinting um, tech. And so I'd, I was reading a bit more about tech shot. And I think it's really cool that you're, um, it mentioned that you're, you know, pulling talent from uh, the area. And you're also clearly working with the scientists that you designed these, um, these equipment for. And so it seems very interdisciplinary, right? Um, and it's coming straight back to the point that I made in the beginning that a lot of us probably thought we'd be an astronaut. <laughs> and uh, now, you know, you realize if even if you can't be an astronaut, there's so many different ways you can live out that dream and still do cool things for uh, something related to space. So thank you again. Um, we are uh, very, going to go into the Q&A, but before then, um, again, if someone has a bingo, because I feel like at this point, I might have a bingo. <laughs> um, if anyone has bingo, please, uh, great. I think we have one bingo, at least in the Zoom chat. Um, go ahead and just say bingo, um, type it out, I mean, and uh, let us know if you have the, or send us the URL as well. So we will make sure to follow up with you guys and uh, figure out a way to get you your price um so yes okay well thank you everyone for being here we're going to move into our q a now 
Um, so once again, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Um, we heard from Dr. Wishashi Dadwal about uh, bone healing in space, as well as a little bit more about social um, behavior, social isolation a little bit, which takes us right into what Dr. Jody Lucas talked about, um, which was the neuroscience behind uh, isolation and depression. And then Dr. R or, uh, Rich Bowling, who talked to us about the biotechnology that uh, aboard space stations that allow us to conduct research um, in space. So now we're going to go into our Q&A panel. Um, again, feel free to drop your questions if you had any into the Zoom chat or the chat of whatever app you might be streaming in for, from. Um, okay, so to start off, um, I, we had a lot of, you know, um, information about how we do rodent research and other types of animal research to help us understand space travel, uh, space function, different ways. I would like to know, um, and I'll ask you guys individual questions, but we're going to talk a little bit about translation to human beings um, and what that research, how it applies to human beings. So uh, Dr. Dadval, you talked about bones. Uh, how similar do you think mice bones are to human bones? And do you think that the, you know, some of the things that you talked about, like bone density and the pores and stuff like that, how translatable is that to when human beings go into space and lose density and how we would treat that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we've been doing rodent research on Earth for a lot of years now, and also extrapolating from what we know in rodent research to human beings. Um, so I think it, it's a relevant model to use. And the fact that, um, uh, well, a, a bigger part of what the rodent research that uh, we were doing was also looking at therapeutics that help um, the bones of these mice, which then can be extrapolated into something translation as uh, when uh, we have future uh, human missions, what kind of um, med pack kit should they be carrying? What drugs should be in there? Which drugs are safe to use in the absence of gravity versus uh, you know, being on Earth, because uh, we've seen differences, and this is not something that I discussed, but we've seen differences in how drugs act, because uh, the bone is such a mechanical um, organ, how the drugs act in a mechanical uh, context as compared to no gravity. So pretty relevant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, awesome. Thank you. And uh, along the same lines, um, for, for Dr. Lucas, how, you know, you mentioned about a lot of research um, that you talked about focused on adolescents, how, um, uh, you know, how applicable is that to adults, humans that would be traveling? Because that would be, you know, astronauts or all adults. So how do you think your research is translatable to that, to those people? So I just focus on adolescents because like, that's where we see the greatest effects, at least in rodent research is for the effects of social isolation, but you do see effects of social isolation in adulthood, especially um, extended periods of social isolation. And I think that since in space, it's, you know, so stressful and so extended and so isolating that I think that it's probably the same effects you see due to adolescent stress would you'd probably see in adult astronauts that are undergoing long-term space exploration. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay, so then for Rich, uh, that question is, you know, you talked about a lot of the, a lot of the uh, technology or equipment is mainly for rodent research or animal research. How, um, or is it difficult to extrapolate that to, you know, human size research? <laughs> Um, so it's um, apparently our, our, our principal investigators find it um, helpful enough. Uh, we I think about our, our, our PI for our Drosophila flight where we sent up 650 uh, fruit flies and, uh, and, uh, and eggs and uh, we got back something like 12,000. And uh, the, the PI was saying that 70% of the, of the diseases, the disease states that can affect uh, the Drosophila um, so also can affect humans. And so uh, she was specifically looking at heart function and heart function in long-term space exploration. If it's six to nine months to get to Mars and, um, and then you have to stay there for 
quite some time before he can come back another six to nine months. That that's this is a really a huge huge problem, a huge question, a very thoughtful intent. She found that from her research with these twelve thousand uh, Drosophila that we got back, looking at specifically the heart function, that she could extrapolate a lot of data from that. It was very helpful. Um, and and it went, like right now, there's eleven people on board the space station. So even if they all eleven would allow you to examine them in great detail. Um, it's, that's not 12,000. So, so I think that the, she's found quite a bit of benefit in uh, extrapolating that over to, uh, to a space crew for a long-term mission. We also do a lot of non-animal research too with uh, uh, looking at um, cardiomyocytes and looking at uh, their human cardiomyocytes and their health and their long-term viability in microgravity. So I, I think our PI seem to find quite a bit of value too. Sweet. Yeah, that looks pretty, that sounds pretty diverse, um, especially if you're going to focus on basic research and then, you know, find ways to uh, take that further into human research at, that's, at some point. Um, cool, thank you. Uh, okay, so back to Dr. Godval. I guess we'll come back to Earth for a little bit and um, ask you, what do astronauts uh what would they do once they come back in terms of like you know if they've had bone loss or bone density loss how would they would they um take you know certain bone forming drugs or um is bone loading something that's enough to gain back some of the bone that they've lost so um i i don't know much about their um like clinical uh routine that they when they come back i do know based on the data they had previously from astronauts uh, losing a lot of the bone mineral density. That's why they uh, brought in that program where I think astronauts, they work out almost 60 to 80% of their day at the International Space Station, just so that they can have enough bone loading and muscle mass building and everything. Uh, so that they, even though that they're losing a lot of bone mineral density, it's not as dramatic. Um, I also know that when they come back, they slowly start regaining the bone uh, that they've lost. The mineral, the mineral, their bone mineral density comes back within, I want to say, or comes close to what it was within a couple of years, just because they're on Earth, they're again putting that same pressure back. So the bone system is like activated again. Um, the bone cells know what they're doing, building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, I did not know that. Um, that they, that is just naturally you know, due to the gravitational differences just comes back. Cool. Okay. Uh, cool. So Dr. Lucas, uh, this is something I'm curious about uh, in terms of social isolation. You talked a little bit about the, the neurochemistry and like the pathways and um, uh, that would be relevant for social isolation. Do you think that there's uh, a way to maybe treat like astronauts that would go into space beforehand or during and then um, th that would somehow lessen some of the adverse effects that you get from being alone in space or being, you know, limited human human in interaction. I think that is a fantastic question, and I think that um, we're still trying to develop good treatments for depression that don't have a lot of side effects, and that. Uh, you know, like identifying biomarkers that may make you at risk for developing, like having a greater reaction or, you know, greater development of depressive like symptoms. Um, I mean, you, I'm guessing they probably get sent into space probably with antidepressants it's because since it is such a um, common thing, I think that they suffer from, from the social isolation or, or even just being like constantly around the same like four or five people and having to deal with that conflict. You know, like there's probably already some type of, you know, anxiolytic or like SSRI or some type of depressive like agent. Yeah. I don't know though. Cool. I think that would be interesting to study for the future. <laughs> Although I don't think you could just, you know, give every single astronaut something before they go, but who knows if that's as big of an issue. Well, you know, um, like maybe they could scan their like genes or something and find like that a certain genetic mutation yeah. leads to increased depressive like symptoms in space. And like, then those people get treated, you know, right away before yeah. they even go into space or something, right? Yes, precision medicine. I think that's <laughs> probably the future <laughs> of everything. Um, yeah, that's uh, 
that is a very cool thought. And I have something, I don't, yeah, I have something similar to ask um, Rich. So, well, it's not similar, but it's related to this like um, technology that seems to be different, that would be different here on earth versus in space. So you mentioned measuring mass in space. Um, how exactly does the X-ray radiation um, work in zero gravity? And could you please explain it a bit more? The, the, uh, the bone densitometer that we have there calculates mass, calculates bone mineral density um, by, um, by pixels, it counts pixels of a, and analyzes pixels. So it takes a picture it takes the x-ray, then it takes a, you know, uh, literally a picture of the x-ray and has an algorithm that calculates that. Now there are other uh, mass measurement devices on board the station, even some even from ICE. Um, and the one that I've seen, it, it, it looks the most interesting is measuring the mass of the crew. Again, crew health, Scott Kelly was up there for a year and it'd be important to know if he was maintaining his muscle mass. Uh, you're right, they do work out an incredible amount of time. Uh, every day to maintain their their muscle mass, but it what it looks like is uh, like like a pogo stick that they hug, and it moves back and forth and back and forth, and it just applies a force and you know measures the resistance to that force, and it, and it just calculates the mass after watching you know the, the astronauts sort of hug this looks like a uh, a bar stool, if you will, um, and then it, it calculates it after a few moments. So there's certainly ways to do that and. Um, and, it, and that is super important to our customers. Um, you mentioned the bone mass. I remember hearing that the, the world record for space flights actually held by a Russian. I think it was 14 months in space and Scott Kelly was up there just, just about 12 months. And the story I heard was it took that, that uh, cosmonaut about three years to totally get the bone mass back um, after not really having any sort of on-orbit treatments. This was the, the uh, when I was on board the Russian Mir space station. Mm -hmm. I don't think they had nearly the kind of exercise equipment that we had on board. And, and, and although in three years, the muscle, the, the bone mass did come back, it was still remodeled a little bit. So it was strong, but maybe shaped a little bit differently. Uh, space is weird. Yeah, space is weird. <laughs> Clearly everyone, everyone's talks today showed that. And I feel like everything I read about space travel is like crazier and crazier every single every single time they find out something that doesn't work <laughs> or um, even in terms of uh, finding places that we can inhabit in outer space. Um, I think that that is obviously something that people are looking into and I think it's a very interesting concept. So I actually have a question for Dr. Dudwald that's connected to that because um, you know we talk about possibly setting up camp in Mars. Um, and in places like Mars and the moon and probably a few other planets that we know of, there is some gravity. I mean, it's not zero gravity. Um, and so if we were to possibly go live there, um, is that lessened gravity enough to protect uh, bone from the, you know, the space induced bone loss that you talked about? So I think Mars is 40% of the gravity that Earth has. So. Um, now you're not yet, now you're getting only 40% of the signal to your bones mm -hmm. to stimulate and to build. So I I think I think if it was a short while, which is not gonna be because it's like uh, almost for I don't even know, several months of uh, travel to get to Mars. And as of now, they're assuming that the first couple of expedi expeditions that go to Mars will stay there and colonize. So it's gonna be a long term. <laughs> 40% signaling. So I'm pretty sure that's going to affect their bones and cause some decrease in their bone mineral density. However, we're an adaptable species. So maybe we'll be like, okay, we can deal with this. Or, you know, the next generation to come just has, I don't know, awesome. uh, bone. <laughs> cool. All right. So eventually we might possibly look different if we were to stay on Mars for too long. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good to know. <laughs> uh, again, I feel like Elon Musk should know all of this uh, before he sends people out to space. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, all right, so four months in space and then possible, uh, you know, possibly setting up someplace in Mars to live on. That's still a lot of time that you're still spending with a small group of people. 
Um, so for Dr. Lucas, if you, is this stress um, that the stress induced uh, effects or the stress overall that human beings feel or, you know, adolescent rats or mice feel, is that from being alone or is that, um, you know, like completely isolated or is that just from like not having the same amount of social interaction with a bigger group of people? Yeah, I think it's the um, lack of social interaction or just abnormal social interaction even, like abnormal peer interactions that can lead to the increased negative impacts is that you're not having, you know, you may just be in your little few people, but you're not having your normal interactions outside <laughs> of those, that little, you know, just what we've been experiencing the last year, like, you know, um, so I think it's just the, it's the lack, it's not necessarily social isolation, it's the lack of the normal development, the normal, be, you know, interactions that you have. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you think that if there was a diverse enough group of people that that would be fine, um, like on a space station? Probably. I, I mean, I think that it's still like very, or like still away from your family, you know, like if your family's not there, if you still have like, you know, not those interactions. I think like being away from your family has the, a big effect. Like if you- Okay. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, and, and especially in terms of space travel, because if you're not going with your family, uh, which there are a lot of like individuals who would go, um, or if you're like handpicked, like astronauts are, um, you're, you're, you're moving away from one social group and then going into another that might not be the same. So cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So, uh, for Rich, uh, what are some of the difficulties that you run into when you're designing, um, certain machines and uh, for space? Um, and do you have to take, you know, any considerations into account that you wouldn't have to, if you were making that on earth? Absolutely. So, um, Things just float away <laughs> in space, right? You have to you have to put little tethers on every little piece that you make, um, and you have to design something to be operated by absolutely really smart people, but they may have never seen this equipment before, and mm -hmm. suddenly they have to jump in. Um, so back in the space shuttle days, we would come into a room with the astronauts, and we would all sit around the table. Put the device on the table and they could touch it and move it and play with it and um, they were thoroughly trained and now we uh, we make a little video we write really extensive instructions and then we have the benefit of sitting on our console here and being able to talk to them and answer questions but um they're again all, all really bright people uh they don't take a lot of training but still um it's something that i i don't on, on earth, you might develop a product and at least your customers know about your product before they just walked in and bought it, right? They have some knowledge of it. Um, and it's just it's just less so, let's say, um, in space. And then just how things move and um, and work. We, we originally designed a payload once that had uh, little stir bars in it to, to mix some solution in microgravity. And, and we found out on tests on uh, uncrewed suborbital rockets that we did that those little stir bars would get jammed up and wedged in a lot of places in the microgravity sort of free float period. And that just sent us back to the drawing board to pin them in there in a certain way that that, that couldn't happen. Um, we've gotten good at it now, I guess, after 30 years and sort of understanding and thinking in three dimensions like that. Um, but it was tougher earlier. The, the plant stuff we're doing now too is something that we've had to spend a lot of time thinking about how to make farmers out of astronauts and how to do that in, in zero G where water can just float out of your, your pot plant, your little plant. Um, but speaking of this, the, sort of the psychological benefits uh, to, to long-term crews, growing healthy, growing plants, having them able to eat fresh vegetables and, and greens, you know, things that are fresh, super important to spaceflight crews. Um, something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about how to optimize that. Um, to, to let them be a part of the process, let them be a part of tending that crop and checking on it and whether it's a flower, you know, zinnias have been grown in space, or radishes, 
Uh, we'll be growing uh, chili peppers next. So uh, ast astronauts talk about losing the, uh, they, they need a little spicier food in microgravity for some reason. So we're gonna help them out with some, uh, some chili peppers coming up. It's things that you wouldn't have thought to think about, you know, otherwise. Yeah, that is really cool. Again, I think it's really, really cool when, um, you know, for something like this, especially when you have so many different um, uh, fields and there's there needs to be a lot of interdisciplinary like interaction because the astronauts are not even coming from the same backgrounds. And I, I think it's really cool that you work with them um, and kind of, you know, train them basically on the ground and keep them in mind when you send things up there. Um, and I think that's really cool. So I have a final question related to that for Dr. Adval, which is, do you train um, people, you know, the astronauts to work with the mice or take care of the mice in space? <laughs> Uh, not me personally. They have the NASA team that actually does that. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that. So uh, we, we've we been working with mice. Well, I've been working with mice for the past 10 years now. And then my lab, uh, Dr. Kasina has been working with mice her entire career. And how quickly we can do things is very different from how quickly the astronaut on space on the International Space Station can do things because of the same issues that Rich just mentioned, things fly away and they're wearing these giant gloves and trying to do like minute things. So there were a lot of um, changes in our protocol that we had to adapt for the astronauts as to what they can do and what they can't do while they're sending us our samples back. Okay, very interesting. Well, I think that that is our time for questions. Um, again, I want to emphasize, we're very, very grateful and thankful that you guys took uh, time out of your very busy schedules to join us on a Tuesday night. Um, and uh, we really appreciate it on Monday night. I don't even know what day it is anymore. Um, <laughs> thank you again. Um, we are going to um, wrap this up. One last, um, one last reminder for bingo. <laughs> And uh, again, just put it in the chat if you've got bingo. And as for all of our speakers, thank you guys so much.